What's up friends and welcome back to another eSkate video. In this video we're going to be taking a technical look at my enclosure design for the $500 electric mountain board kit. Thanks for checking out my channel. The main goal of this video is to kind of technically break down exactly what I do to design an enclosure for a board like this one. And by the end of the video, you should know a little bit about the engineering design process, Fusion 360, and how I printed all of these enclosure segments. This is going to be a bit of a technical one, so I've included a bunch of timestamps down along the little scroll bar beneath the video. As an engineer, there's a little bit of information that every one of us has in the back of our head that we learn in school. And this is called the engineering design process. Now, every product that goes through an actual company will go through this process in one way or another. And while every company has their different ways of doing things, the main point is to get a product from an idea to actually being in your hands. So not every single thing an engineer does goes through this process but it's kind of something that you keep in the back of your head and you go through as you're doing your work. And if I were to explain the entire thing, it would take too long. So I'll give you a basic gist of it. The first step is the empathize phase. And in this phase, you talk to your customer, you figure out what you want your product to do, what exactly they need, what are they trying to accomplish with it. After you go through the empathize phase, you go into the defining phase. And in the defining phase, you create an idealized concept of what the customer wants. So internally, you'll list all of your requirements, your specifications, and what exactly you need to do. After you've defined your requirements, you go into the ideate phase. And I would say this one is pretty fun because in this phase, you get to brainstorm. And in this phase, you come up with all the concepts. And sometimes it can be really fun. Other times it can be really grueling depending on what it is that you're trying to come up with. The fourth phase is the prototyping phase. In this phase, you, it really depends on what company you're working for, what you're doing, but it can really wildly vary in what you're actually going to do for prototyping. Some companies have working prototypes that they send out to people and they get feedback on. Others, the prototype is just proof concept. After the fourth phase, you go into the fifth phase, which is the testing phase. In this phase, you test your product. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but you go through, you test every single aspect of your product to see if it meets the requirements, and then you talk to your customer, you show them your prototype, and then between stages four and five, you might repeat a few times before getting to your final polished product. My brainstorming phase for this project wasn't incredibly interesting, but it worked out and didn't take too much time. One of the things in industry that you often do as an engineer is you look at other people and you see how things are designed, and then you take some inspiration from that, and you improve on it or change it to make it into what you want. For this particular project, if you remember in the last video in the series, I mentioned that the kit kind of looked like an onboard GT which it basically is. So I remembered off the top of my head that the Onboard GT has a pretty simple enclosure design. And I thought that would be a great one to replicate as it looks good and should be pretty easy to print. Turned out that that was true and it worked out great for me. So why don't we hop right into the design process and I can show you guys a little bit about how we got from idea to printing it. I designed all of these enclosure segments in a program called Fusion 360. And Fusion is a free program to hobbyists and students that I've been using for over six years now. And I'm pretty comfortable with it. I did all of this design work a little while ago, but I recorded it. So we'll go through these videos and I'll kind of talk through some of the basic steps that I took to get to the final product. And if I went through everything, it would probably take over an hour, so we're not going to do that. And I'll just kind of hit some of the important points. So in this first video, the first thing that I did was I did a CAD model of the actual battery cells. And these are the cells, they're 18650 cells that we'll be using, and there's 50 of them. And you can see on the screen, 
There's 10 cells in series here, and then there's five sets of those series groups. So that makes up the 10S 5P battery. And I'll explain a little bit more in the next video about the battery, what exactly that means. So there's a million different ways that you can do CAD. And obviously my way is just one of those, but the way that I did this is I took a sketch profile that makes up the, the bottom square of the enclosure, the edges, sides, and screw holes. And I used a loft, which is a function in CAD software that goes from one profile to another to create the basic shape. And then I extruded the screw holes through, I created the curvature, I added the wire holes, and then on the special enclosure segments, like the front and back, I added the extra holes for the power button and the charge port, as well as the exit wires, and then some slots for balance wires as well. So anyway, while this is going on in the background, uh, this is just the basic sketch. And this actual recording, I ended up scrapping this first design, which is something that happens a lot in engineering. You do CAD multiple times before you get it right. You can see the bottom profile and the top profile. And the loft tool is going to connect those in the way that it thinks is proper. Sometimes you have to mess with it to get the actual result you want. And this first attempt, I used a shell which I decided I didn't want because that creates equal thicknesses all around the enclosure. So in the second video, I went through and took a look at the design, deleted it, and then went on to create the actual thing that you see printed out. So some of the other basic things here are the enclosure holes and then the curvature. So first of all, the enclosure holes, I created them by extruding through the bottom plane and just going all the way through the model. And those are just for the screws to go through and go straight into the inserts that are gonna be on the board. Now, you might wonder how the screws will actually stay on there because it doesn't look like those holes on the screen will actually be able to fit a screw head and you would be correct. If you look at this closely you can see that there's actually a step in there and that step is created by adding a extrusion plane or a reference plane rather part way up in the model and then sketching the four larger holes onto that and then dragging those through as well to create the much larger hole. And at this point, most of the enclosure here is done and the rest is just a bunch of fine tweaking. So we'll skip past all that. And at this point, I create the arc, which is just a guess on what I thought the arc of the actual board would be. And I ended up checking it and I pretty much nailed it the first try, which doesn't always happen. But that only works for the center of the board. So the reason I did it this particular way by uh, cutting down the center of the enclosure and then going forwards and back was so that I could have a different curve profile on the front of a shell and on the back of the shell. Because on pieces like the back one, the rear, curve actually comes down further than the front curve and it's pretty hard to see but it's a couple millimeters and it really does make the difference when you actually set it down on the board itself. So after finishing up the basic enclosure design I just went through, I plopped them all in the model and I thought wow that looks pretty good and then I realized that I needed to make a different enclosure for the front and that took a little bit more work. But the more interesting one is the back one. I think that one might be in the next segment.
Yeah, it is. So this is a more updated version of the enclosure. You can see I did some more rounding off on the edges. I added the wire channels. I added the balance wire channel. And now I think I'm saving a new one. Yeah, so one of the ways you save some work on doing CAD like this is you just take one of your basic models, you save as, and then you just continue working on it in the new file. So. What I did here is I realized the exiting wire channel needs to be a lot bigger to allow for the phase wires to come out. And then I need to add the two holes for the, the power button and the charge port. So we're just gonna skip through a lot of this because there's a lot of messing around here. So again, with the ability to extrude both forwards and backwards, I realized that this was not a flawless plan and I ended up having to create another sketch in the center so I could do a different front and back. And you can see here it's starting to take more shape by modifying the rear curve so that it would come closer down to the deck. Modified the wire channels a little bit see if I can find the <clears throat> power button. So here I sketched directly onto the side of the enclosure here and I sketched on a very specific plane because I knew exactly how deep I needed to go and that since these were at different angles it would probably collide. So I ended up having to do a few extrudes here but the main point was to make it so that the actual charge port would be parallel with the angle of the side of the enclosure because I thought that would look the best. So here we draw out the power button hole or the charge port hole, pop it through. And I added a little bit of a step on it actually to make it so that the shoulder of the charge port would sit nicely down onto the enclosure. So you can see that little raised bit that evens out the, the different heights to an equal sitting area. And that's about it really. The hole for the power button is almost exactly the same. So I don't think I'm gonna go through that video in the interest of time. But this is basically the final product there of the rear enclosure. And you can see that right here. It came out pretty nice if I do say so myself. So I was supposed to have audio over this clip, but it somehow vanished. So the main gist of what I'm saying here is that we're all done with the enclosure design, so now it's time to print. Enjoy the montage. you enjoyed that super speed printing. Let's wrap up the video with some final thoughts and little notes. I think it's super awesome to design and print your own enclosures and you can really learn a lot from the experience. Sometimes you have some hiccups but fortunately for me it worked out all right. This is the third board that I've designed a different unique enclosure for and all of them are still working just fine. So they can be pretty durable if you make them right. For me, I didn't have a single issue printing any of these enclosures, and that's kind of lucky because with 3D printing, sometimes it can be hit or miss. 
Fortunately, with my newer printer, the Artillery Sidewinder X1, I didn't have any issues. Along with that, I used a software called Simplify 3D, which is an advanced slicing software that has a lot of configurability. And I've been using that for quite a while, so I'm pretty comfortable with its functions and how to tune the printer properly. There's a ton of great videos on YouTube of how to tune your printer properly, so I would encourage you guys to check out some of those if you're interested in that process. Well, it sounds like I did have everything go all fine and dandy. I mean, there were some issues along the way. If you had a sharp eye or remember from before, I mentioned that I added some wire channels partway through the printing process, and so some of them are a little different. But that's okay, I can always just add some wire channels the old-fashioned way by dremeling it out. Fortunately, that's okay because I'm going to be using some neoprene rubber that will go around the edges of each enclosure to keep the moisture and dust out. Hope you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for the next one where I go through the process of what it takes to make 50 cells into a safe and reliable power source. I'll see you guys soon. Peace out.